Thank you everyone for taking the time out of your days to be here. Um, as Paul said, my thesis research focused on aspects of the alligator snapping turtle or Macrochiles tamenchii in Texas. And this state forms the southwestern edge of the species distribution in Texas. Um, my thesis project was overseen by principal investigators, Dr. Chris Schock and Dr. Dan Sines, both of whom are with the US Forest Service. And I'll jump right in and start out with some pertinent background information on the natural history of the species. If here we go, sorry for the lag. So one of the challenges in studying this species is it's almost never observed. It's um, very well camouflaged and almost exclusively aquatic. And like many other freshwater turtle species, it's characterized <clears throat> by a slow life history in which juveniles have a very high mortality rate. Furthermore, it takes individuals up to 21 years to reach sexual maturity. However, once individuals do mature, they tend to have a very high survival rate. And due to these life history traits, the species is susceptible to population declines when adult cohorts do face high mortality. And I'll uh, touch on that again in the next slide. And lastly, I'll just say that uh, the species has had little scientific attention in Texas until recently, and that's changed. Now the species has garnered lots of attention in Texas and other states. Now, this species was commercially harvested in the past, particularly in the 1960s and 70s. And this photograph shows skulls of some, alli of some alligator snapping turtles that were captured by a professional trapper in Georgia in the 1970s. Now, as I said in the last slide, due to the species life history traits, population, populations declined as a, as a result of commercial harvest to the point where it became no longer lucrative. And different states, or the various states the species occurred in began to implement protections for the species. Texas did so in 1987 by listing it as threatened, which effectively made recreational and commercial harvest illegal. Now, commercial harvest no longer occurs in all the 14 states the species is known to occur. However, recreational harvest is still legal in Louisiana and Mississippi. Now, there are several contemporary conservation concerns uh, regarding the alligator snapping turtle. Among these are habitat alterations, such as channelization and impoundments of its aquatic habitat, uh, incidental capture on passive fishing equipment, such as jug lines and trot lines, and unsustainable legal and illegal take, uh, as well as poaching. And due to these contemporary concerns, in November of last year, the Fish and Wildlife Service proposed listing the species as threatened. And another reason the species was proposed is that its range has actually been documented to be contracting. So I've put together this map that shows all 14 states the species has been documented to occur in recent history. And I'd like to draw y'all's attention to the westernmost three states. In Kansas, the last observation of the species was in 1991 in the far southeastern corner of the state. Um, the species has not been observed since this time, so it is possible it's been eradicated from this state. Similarly, in Oklahoma, a series of hoop trap surveys that took place in the early 2000s were used to infer that the species range had also contracted to the southeastern corner of this state relative to historical occurrence records. And given what's happened in these two western states, it's important for us to have a contemporary understanding of the species status in Texas um, to inform the overall status of the species throughout its range and help a deficient wildlife service with its final listing decision. Now, there has been previous research conducted on the species in Texas, specifically in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a baseline study conducted in which researchers visited 20, 23 sites in the eastern quarter of the state and attempted to detect the species by deploying baited hoop, tra hoop traps as seen in this photo. 
16 of these 23 sites were confirmed occupied. And I've shown the locations of all the survey sites. Green circles indicate sites where the species was captured. Red sites are where it was not detected. Now, all the shaded counties in this map show counties where the species was documented to occur in the scientific literature at the point in time the report on the study was completed in 2002. Furthermore, up to this point in time, the species was documented from seven watersheds in East Texas. These were the Red, Sulphur, and Cypress, which are part of the Greater Mississippi Watershed, as well as the Sabine, Natchez, Trinity, and San Jacinto watersheds, which drain directly into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, in this study, survey effort was also allocated to two sites in the Brazos watershed, and this is because there is a recent fossil record or fossil of Macrocheles dated back to the Pleistocene in the Brazos watershed. However, at the point in time this survey was completed, there was no evidence the species occurred in this watershed. And my thesis research built off this previous study, and one of the research questions was, what the full extent of the species range was within watersheds it was confirmed to be present. So it's known to occur in all the watersheds I've delineated in this map by this red line, but there were still gaps in the knowledge of its distribution. So I allocated a greater survey effort to try and answer this question. Furthermore, it would be beneficial if we could predict where the species was most likely to occur and where it was most likely to occur in the highest numbers given environmental variables. So I incorporated modeling into my thesis as well. And lastly, the alligator snapping turtle is very long lived and it has the capability to feed on organisms occupying high trophic positions. So because of this, it may be exposed to high levels of aquatic contaminants. So I assessed levels of mercury in individuals. So for the rest of this talk, I'll go through each of these questions one by one. So I'll start talking about the distribution and then modeling of its occupancy and abundance and conclude with results of mercury analysis. As in the previous study that was conducted in the late 90s and early 2000s, I attempted to direct to detect alligator snapping turtles using hoop traps as seen in this photo. So myself, along with colleagues, technicians, and volunteers, sampled 51 aquatic water bodies throughout eastern Texas. Surveys were standardized by deploying 15 traps. And furthermore, at each site, we conducted three consecutive 24-hour surveys. And by conducting multiple surveys at a site, I was able to estimate the false negative error rate in detection, or in other words, the probability that I would fail to detect the turtle when it was actually present at a site. Now, here are some, uh, some results from that survey. We detected the species at 31 of 51 sites, so we confirmed 61 sites occupied by the alligator snapping turtle. We detected a total of 220, 222 individuals, which gives an overall catch rate or catch peanut effort of roughly one turtle per every 10 trap nights. Now, just for comparison, the previous study documented a catch rate that was about half this value. And this is most likely attributable to a slight difference in methods between the two studies. In my survey efforts, we put bait into PVC canisters and tied back into the traps. And by placing bait in canisters, turtles were unable to consume the bait. Now, in the previous study, bait was simply tied into the trap. So the first turtle that entered could consume the bait, which may have eliminated the motivation or impetus for subsequent turtles to enter the trap. So this is the most likely explanation for that drastic difference in catch rate between the two surveys. Now, this slide has two size class frequency histograms. The first one shows sizes of turtles that were captured in the previous study. 
and the lower one shows turtles that were captured during my thesis. Now, both distributions are similar and did not differ statistically from normal distributions. Uh, the main difference is that in my survey efforts, we documented a larger size class of turtles, and this is uh, most likely attributable just to us uh, conducting more surveys. Both surveys showed a similar proportion of juveniles to adults, as well as an even sex ratio of males to females. So juveniles are indicated on these histograms in white, females in dark gray, and males in light gray. So as you can see, males tend to get much larger than females. The species does exhibit sexual size dimorphism. So <clears throat> assuming there was no bias in capture between the sexes, this indicates that there's an even sex ratio of the species throughout Texas. Um, I would like to note though that this is full data from 51 survey sites. In, in the contemporary study, it was 51 survey sites. Um, so the sex ratio may differ at local sites. Moving on to the distribution of the species, we documented nine new county records over the past two and a half years. Um, these counties are indicated in dark brown on this map. So the other shaded counties indicate those where the species has been documented to occur as of May 2022. So as you can see, we filled in a lot of knowledge gaps regarding the species distribution. It occurs throughout eastern Texas. This map shows two main take home points. First, it shows all our survey sites. X's indicate those where we failed to capture alligator snapping turtles and circles indicate those where we did detect it. Larger circles indicate a greater catch rate. Now, we failed to detect the species from the Red River watershed, as well as the Brazos watershed to the southwest. So again, at this point in time, there's no evidence the species occurs in the Brazos watershed. Now, the second thing this figure shows is a unimodal or hump-shaped pattern in catch rate over a latitudinal gradient. And this is indicated by the different shades to each of the watersheds we capture the species. The highest average per site catch per unit effort and highest overall catch per unit effort was in the Natchez watershed indicated in the darkest gray. Watersheds to the north and south of this watershed had decreasing catch rates. So I'll talk more about this pattern in a little bit, but the take home point for now is that the Netches had the highest catch peanut effort followed by the Sabine River. Now on the topic of the species distribution, there are two main things that I'd like to note. First, um, in early 2021, I received uh, photographs of alligator snapping turtles from the San Bernard River. And this is worth mentioning because this river is actually to the west of the Brazos. So this photo shows a young individual that was captured on a trot line. And to the right, there's a still of a video of an adult male hooked on a jug line. Now I conducted a survey at the same stretch of the river where these individuals were purported to have come from and failed to detect any. So it's possible if the species is occurring here, it's at densities too low for me to detect with my methods. Now, how these individuals got here um, is a mystery. I think it could, it's equally likely that they disperse naturally during high water or storm events because this river is coastal. They could have also been translocated by humans. And lastly, on the topic of the species distribution, I'd like to know one other thing. I frequently read in the literature, even contemporary publications, that the species range in Texas extends westward to the San Antonio River. Now, this figure was pulled from Peter Pritchard's book on the alligator snapping turtle written in the 1980s. And all the stars on this map correspond to observations of the species. Now, I've been unable to trace back um, 
where this observation from the San Antonio River came from, nor has anyone else. Um, and many prominent herpetologists, such as the late James Dixon, consider this record to be erroneous, as no one knows where it came from. However, there is another record from the Colorado River watershed in Travis County, and this can be traced back to a passage of a book written by Louis Agassiz in 1857. And I've read through this passage and it never explicitly states that the species was documented from Travis County or from the Colorado watershed. So I think this record is likely the result of a failed game of telephone through time where a source gets cited and misinterpreted over and over. Um, there's no evidence the species occurs in either of these watersheds naturally. However, uh, there have been several recent observations of the species in the hill country of Texas, and I would argue that these are almost definitely translocated individuals. All right, moving on. I, uh, I assessed my survey data using models as well, and there's several reasons I did this. If I were to just take my survey data at face value and assume that the species was absent at sites where I failed to detect it, that would require assuming that my methods had perfect detectability. Or in other words, that this that I had a detection probability of 1 or 100%. And this is almost certainly not the case, especially regarding such a cryptic species as the alligator snapping turtle. Furthermore, if I were to use catch per unit effort as a proxy or index of relative abundance, that would require assuming that variation in abundance between sites is the only source of variation in detection. However, there's lots of other sources of variation that can influence catch per unit effort. Um, there's environmental factors as well as methodological factors. So, by using models, I could account for imperfect detection of the species to get less biased estimates of occupancy probability and the average per site abundance. Furthermore, I could quantify the effects of different environmental variables on occupancy and abundance and test hypotheses. So this slide just gives a brief qualitative overview of the two models I used. First, I used a site occupancy model which uses binary detection, non-detection data to provide an estimate of the probability of detecting at least one individual in the species on a site, as well as the probability of occupancy or occurrence. Next, I used a multinomial admixture model, and this uses actual count data to provide an estimate of individual detection probability or capture probability as well as an estimate of average per site abundance. So the first step was to account for imperfect detection. And the occupancy model gave an estimate of 0.77. And I've placed the 95% confidence intervals in brackets here. So what does this value mean? Well, if I were to survey 10 streams in East Texas that were all occupied by the alligator sleeping turtle under average survey conditions, I could expect to detect the species in 77% or roughly eight of those streams. Now the multinomial abundance model gave an estimate of 38%. So this means if I were to visit and survey a site occupied by 10 alligator snapping turtles, over the course of three surveys, I could expect to detect roughly four turtles. Now, in reality, I never surveyed under average survey conditions, um, and detectability is likely to vary between surveys and across sites. So to account for this in my models, I used several covariates <clears throat> that I hypothesized to influence detection. Well, first, due to the ectothermia of the species, I hypothesized that variation in water temperature and seasonality could influence its detectability. I also hypothesized, due to its relatively sedentary nature, that periods of high flow would decrease its activity and therefore decrease its chances of going into a trap. 
I also hypothesize that increasing trap saturation or placing traps more tightly packed in an aquatic site would increase detection probability. And lastly, uh, during my field season in 2020, 2021, <clears throat> excuse me, I noticed a pattern in which I failed to detect the species during brightly lit full moon nights. And because of this, I, I incorporated lunar phase as a covariant. And in all the literature on the species I've read, I've only seen one anecdote talking about this. In Peter Pritchard's book on the species, he quotes a trapper as saying that he didn't set hooks for the species during brightly lit nights due to a uh, lower capture rate. So I took these covariates in various combinations <clears throat> and uh, assessed the relative fit of, the, of different models using AIC corrected for small sample size. Now, the best fit model contained these three covariates in the red, red rectangle. This first figure shows the effect of flow velocity on the x-axis, on detection probability on the y-axis. And gray shading indicates 95% confidence intervals. Now, as hypothesized, a uh, greater flow rate corresponds to a lower detection probability of the species. And I think I forgot to mention, I will say these results shown here are for the occupancy model, not the abundance model. There was a similar relationship shown for trap spacing. So on the X axis, I have mean nearest neighbor distance between traps with detection on the Y again. Now, this pattern has important implications for future surveys. If I had the chance to survey for the species again, I would not want to space traps uh, greater than 200 meters apart on average due to, due to detection probability being so low. Lastly, this shows the model's relationship between lunar phase, which is given in radians and detection. Now, the zero and the six on the x-axis both correspond to new moons. So they're the same point on the lunar cycle. And the full moon is shown at 3.14 or pi. So this pattern was strongly supported with my data set, but um, it's tenuous because there is no mechanism I can think of that would explain this relationship. So these were the results, the covariates in the top fit occupancy model. Now the multinomial in-mixture model gave a similar top model, which had flow velocity and trap spacing as the best explainers of variation in detection probability. So I took the covariates in these best fit models and carried them forward in subsequent model selection in which I assess the fit of models that also had covariates that I hypothesized to influence occupancy probability and abundance. But first, I'll go over the average results. So the mean estimated occupancy probability was 82%. And to provide some context, we confirmed 61% of sites occupied. So this result suggests that the species is present at roughly 20% more sites than we detected it at. And this figure just shows all the 31 sites where we detected the species as green circles. Now, the multinomial abundance model gave an average per site estimate of 7.57 turtles. And given that our average stream transect length during our surveys was 0.9 kilometers, this gives a rough density estimate of eight turtles per kilometer. And to provide some context for this estimate, what we actually observed in our surveys was an average of just over four turtles per site. So this suggests that many more turtles were present than were detected. So, the next step, next step was to examine how occupancy and abundance varied across sites. So first, I considered models using latitude, longitude, and a quadratic term of latitude as, <clears throat> as explanatory variables of occupancy probability and abundance. And this was not to answer any particular ecological questions. 
it was simply to see if that unimodal pattern and catch rate I noted earlier would still hold after accounting for imperfect detection. So I was expecting to see a uh, greater occupancy probability and abundance farther to the east, as well as at median latitudes. Now, the best fit model had a quadratic term on latitude, and it also included longitude as well. This was the same for both occupancy and abundance. So this, this pattern in catch rate was corroborated uh, by the models, even after accounting for imperfect detection. This figure shows the effect of latitude on the x-axis on the abundance of the species given the multinomial and mixture model. Now the sulfur and red watersheds are located at roughly 33 to 34 degrees latitude. So this suggests that the species occurs in lower numbers at these northern latitudes than at median latitudes where the Neches, Sabine, and Middle Trinity occur. Now I'm inferring that the symmetrical relationship shown at lower latitudes is simply an artifact of us uh, conducting surveys in the southern Brazos watershed where the species is absent. Now, the next set of models I assessed contains covariates that got at uh, ecologically relevant questions. So I delineated each of my survey sites by USGS defined sub watershed and calculated land cover proportions within each sub watershed. I predicted that sites surrounded by greater forest cover and wetlands cover would have a higher occupancy probability and higher abundance by providing more suitable habitat for the species. I predicted the opposite relationship would hold for developed cover and agricultural and pasture cover. Now, according to AIC, the best model of both occupancy and abundance contains uh, only forest cover as a predictor of occupancy and abundance. Now, this figure shows the effect of total forest cover on occupancy probability. And as you can see, there's a very strong relationship at just 20% forest cover. There's already around the 75% occupancy probability, which uh, approaches one with higher forest cover. Now, although forest cover was the best relative predictor of abundance of the species, confidence intervals of the parameter estimate overlapped zero. And furthermore, the effect size or the slope was very small. So this means that although it was the best predictor of the land cover variables I examined, there are other variables that influence abundance and forest cover alone is not a suitable predictor of the, spe of the species numbers. Nevertheless, occupancy was best explained by forest cover and forest cover did a great job at explaining variation in occupancy. My main hypothesis for why this is, is that large scale forest cover captures information on variation in in-stream habitat over a large scale. And many other studies have documented a uh, tightly knit positive association between watershed scale forest cover and in-stream habitat. For example, greater amounts of forest cover correspond to greater amounts of woody debris and canopy cover. And both woody debris and canopy cover are habitat features that the species preferentially associates with. We know this through telemetry studies. Furthermore, watershed scale forest cover has also been documented to associate with an increase in submerged structure in stream and an increase in the number of pooled areas. And again, submerged structure and pooled areas are microhabitat features the species prefers. So I think this is the, the most likely mechanism explaining this relationship. So to provide some take home bullet points up to this point in my, in my talk. Well, first, I think it's important that we didn't detect any individuals in the Red River watershed. Um, the northern half of the Red River watershed is in Oklahoma, where the species range has been documented to be contracting. So, um, it's concerning to me that we didn't detect any here, and 
I would hypothesize that the species range has contracted concomitantly on the Texas side as well. However, this is just conjecture because there's no baseline data on the species range within the Red River watershed specifically. Um, I will say that the species does occur in this watershed in Bowie County, and there was a recent observation from the Red from Red River County. So it does still occur in this watershed in Texas, at least in the far eastern extent. Again, there's no evidence the species occurs in the Brazos. However, between the Brazos and the Red River watershed, the species is persistent throughout, as indicated by the occupancy estimate of 82%. Furthermore, because forest cover does such a good job of predicting where the species is to occur, I would argue that aquatic waters flowing through heavily forested areas should be managed as high priority habitat for the species. All right, shifting gears, I'll talk about the mercury, res mercury results. So during my 2021 uh, survey efforts, whenever I captured turtles, I would take the muscle sample from the tail. I did this using a six millimeter biopsy punch I would also take keratin samples from nail clippings of turtles. Now I analyzed the concentrations of each of these tissue types using a direct mercury analyzer. This instrument is shown in this photo uh, at the biology department at Texas Christian University. And this instrument works by heating samples to 900 degrees Celsius. And the mercury that's volatilized in this incineration is <clears throat> captured via gold amalgamation and then quantified with mass atomic spectroscopy. Now, the first value that I show here is wet weight, the average wet weight concentration of muscle tissue. So this is uh, an important value to consider um, for those who consume the meat of the species. There's an average of 0.31 parts per million, and this is just above the EPA's action limit of 0.3 parts per million. And this action limit is the concentration at which the agency recommends limiting consumption. 42% of our samples were above this value. However, there was a wide range in concentrations from 0.03 parts per million to almost one part per million. And to provide some context for this, this concentration, average concentration of three parts per million is comparable to that which is found in canned tuna. Now, I also compared concentrations in keratin with those in muscle, and all the values provided on this slide are parts per mil are concentrations in parts per million dry weight. So that's why the muscle values are different from those in the previous slide, because they're dry instead of wet weight values. So keratin levels were almost four times that in muscle. And I conducted a simple linear regression to see how well keratin could predict concentrations in muscle. Now, keratin only explains roughly 60% of the variation in muscle. So there is a, a tightly knit relationship, but some noise as well. And lastly, I tested the hypothesis that larger turtles would have higher burdens of mercury. And this is a pattern that's shown in many fish species. And there are several mechanisms that could explain this relationship. One, larger individuals are often older, so they're exposed to more mercury throughout their life. So accumulate more, the larger they get. But it could also be explained by ontogenetic dietary shifts in which larger individuals consume other organisms that occupy higher trophic levels. Now, a simple linear regression revealed that body size, as noted by mid straight midline straight carapace length explained almost none of the variation in muscle mercury concentrations. And this pattern or this lack of pattern is actually very common for turtles. And there's several reasons this could be. It could be that turtles um, have an effective 
means a physiological means of eliminating mercury to counter the uptake rate. It could also be due to ontogenetic dietary shifts in which older individuals have a broader or more herbivorous diet, so they're also feeding on organisms occupying lower trophic positions, so they're not exposed to as much mercury. But the take home points of this aspect of my research is that frequent consumption does carry a moderate health risk, but mercury concentrations cannot be predicted given the size of individuals. Now, there are many people to thank uh, for this for this project. Um, I'll start out by thanking the PIs, Drs. Christopher Schock and Dan Sines. I'd like to thank my other committee members, Dr. Carmen Mont Montagna and Dr. Yang Li Zong. I'd also like to thank Paul Crump, Matt Chumchal, and Mike Kwiatkowski for all their help on this project. Uh, John, Mike, Aubrey, Laura, Jake, and Connor all made the field efforts possible. It wouldn't have happened without them. Uh, this project was funded by a TPWD state wildlife grant, and site access was made possible by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, and TPWD. I'd also like to thank all my lab mates and the volunteers who made the field work more enjoyable. And lastly, Dr. Toby Hibbets, Chris Collins, and Ricky Maxey provided valuable information on the previous study of the species I mentioned, so I'd like to thank them. Now, there's a lot of information I didn't go over, so if anyone has any questions, I'd appreciate them. And I've also placed a citation here um, for a publication we have that's in press. Um, I'm not sure when this will be out, but there is also a TPWG final report that I wrote. Um, if any of you are interested to have more details on this research, I don't think that that report is available online yet, but it may be soon. All right, well, thank you for your time. Thank you, David. Excellent stuff, man. We, uh, we do have a couple of questions in the chat, but I would encourage uh, that now the presentation's over. If anybody has any questions, please post them in the Q&A or the chat. I can keep an eye on, on both. Um, so one of the questions was, um, what, what is the scale of the sub watersheds that you did that analysis at in the occupancy, David? What does that correspond to? Um, well, the size, the surface area varies with topography, but I'd say off the top of my head, um, around 10 kilometers um, in diameter. Okay, so in the kind of a smaller scale then in the grand scheme of things. Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, uh, there's a question about why outside of Texas, um, the turtles are restricted to golf drainages. Any thoughts on why? Outside of Texas, the turtles are restricted to golf drainages. Yeah, there's a question about their eastern distribution outside of Texas, you know, along the east coast. and. Right. Well, I think um, that gets into geology a little bit. And uh, from my understanding, the species has, um, it's mainly associated with the Mississippi watershed. I know in the fossil record, individuals have been found as far north as Nebraska. And I'm not too familiar with the geology of the area, but I imagine periods of sea level rise and recession allowed the species to disperse from the Mississippi um, to those other coastal waters or Gulf draining waters. Good stuff. Um, was there any association to point source pollution, such as coal fired plants, to the individuals with higher mercury levels? Yes. Yes, I didn't go over that today for the sake of time, but that was one of the findings of my thesis research. And that, that information is in the TPWD final report. And what was the, the gist of that, David? It was, it, was, it was related to distance, wasn't it? Yes, so the greater the distance, the, the lower the concentration, 
um, that was dependent on an interactive effect given uh, total forest cover. Um, and there's been, there's oftentimes a positive association between mercury concentrations and forest cover because trees and high forest cover are able to actively uptake mercury from the atmosphere. Okay, great. A couple more questions on the mercury topic. Has there been a threshold identified for symptoms of mercurialism in this species? I don't know if I said that word right. Not in this species, but there are lots of studies done um, that have been done looking at Chelydra or the, the common snapping turtle. Um, I believe there is there was research done out of West Virginia. Um, turtles were sampled from a water that was contaminated by a point source. So they had very high concentrations. And authors found an association. Um, I, I don't want to speak off the top of my head because it's been a while since I read this, but there was a noticeable statistically significant effect on um, it was either birth rate, hatching rate, or um, well, that, that's all I, I will say. But uh, if you, if you're interested in learning more, um, the author of that paper is Bergeron, I believe, B-E-R-G-E-R-O-N. Okay, great. Thank you. Did you find higher mercury concentrations in areas with historic environmental pollution events? Is that something you looked at? That is not something I looked at. Very good. Okay, moving on to different topic. Um, this is about the predators of snapping turtles. Will snapping turtles be consumed by alligators? Yes. Yes. Okay. And what uh, we... another potential predator. Um, I know river otters will eat common snapping turtles, so I imagine they uh, could also eat younger, smaller alligator snapping turtles as well. Okay. What is the juvenile to adult ratio that would be considered reflective of a sustainable population? Oh, that's a good question. I would say similar to the ones that were documented in both studies. So the previous study documented a 20% juveniles. And in my surveys, we documented 30%. And this is unsurprising given what's known about the species life history in which juveniles have a high mortality rate and adults have a high survivorship. So multiple cohorts are able to persist through time. So that I would say that lower proportion of juveniles around the third is to be expected. Would you expect this is my question now, just building off of that. Would you expect the traps? Would you have equal detection or capture probabilities across the size classes? No, I, I imagine there there is some bias between juveniles and adults. Um, juveniles are known to associate with shallower waters. And when we deploy traps in shallower waters, that's where we tended to capture juvenile turtles. Um, however, at a lot of survey sites, we couldn't access shallow waters or they simply weren't present. Um, so there, there is almost certainly some bias there. Got it. Very good. Um, Another question here. How many times, this is about the activity in lunar cycles. How many times did you visit each site? Was the graph you showed based on all sites together, or did you also notice the relationship at a site specific level? It was at a site specific level, but I, so there were over 140 data points um, that was used to, to build that curve in that relationship. So um, each day of survey had its own value in radians for the lunar phase. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
I'm, I'm glad to finally get a, a question on that. No one's ever asked me a question on that before. <laughs> I've, I've been awaiting one. Yeah, there's another question here. Did you have time to look at any potential AST prey source relationship with lunar phase to possibly examine some of the lunar correlation? No, you know, I dove into the literature a little bit when writing my thesis. There's lots of papers out there on uh, fish activity, and ultimately, that there seems to be no clear pattern to me. Some studies will document a strong relationship, other studies, none. Uh, I will say there has been one study done on turtles that I know of pertaining to their foraging, and that was um, there was a higher catch rate on marine long lines of loggerhead turtles um, during full moons, and presumably that's due to there being higher visibility um, but that's actually the opposite relationship of what I noted. So we had a lower detectability during full moons. Have you looked at that same lunar data from a, um, I don't know what, as opposed to radiance, like a, almost like a brightness um, or, you know, like a, I don't I, know what the, what the term is, but I think we talked a little bit about this in the past. I think. Right. I, don't have uh i don't have those data collected from from my surveys i don't know maybe weather stations would have uh data that can be used as a proxy um but the reason i i chose to use lunar phase in radians is in particular was to maintain it as a continuous variable as opposed to a categorical variable so i didn't have to um, include multiple parameters in the model for just one covariate. Okay, great. Okay, we've got some more questions coming in now. Um, have similar studies been performed in other states, and how do your results compare? Yes, um, they've conducted been conducted in quite a few states. Um, so Louisiana, Oklahoma, um, virtually all the states all 14 states in which the species occurs have done um hoop trap surveys or large-scale hoop trap surveys similar to this one uh it's been a long time since i've looked at this but off the top of my head i can confirm that a study in arkansas had a higher overall catch rate than we documented here in texas uh, catch rates were lower in oklahoma and in Louisiana as well. Um, the studies I've read from Louisiana haven't been statewide. Um, there's been one that was conducted recently that was restricted to southwest Louisiana and another one to eastern Louisiana. But the surrounding states <coughs> have documented a lower catch rate with the exception of Arkansas. That's great. Uh... Here we go. Have you considered a mixed sampling strategy? Mixed is in quotes here in the question, such as deploying three sets of five traps with the sets with the sets in it at the end and middle of the transect, and the five traps close together, say 20 meters apart. The idea is to saturate areas because the turtles are uh you know approximately sedentary while also sampling a large area. Do you you know I'm not sure we want to talk about you know, optimizing trap design to capture species in such a public forum. But um, do you, you know, in hindsight, do you feel like the trapping approach worked? Because to some degree, you were replicating previous uh, work, and that, that was more important, really. Yes. Um, well, given everything I've, I've learned through experience during my trapping, I will say what I would do over again is use multiple size traps to try and account for that bias that you just mentioned with the juveniles. So I would like to deploy smaller traps as well um, to get in different areas to try and target juveniles. And I'll, what I'll say is that during my survey efforts, the distance between traps was not standardized. And I don't think it would be feasible to standardize that, that um, distance. 
Uh, they were placed opportunistically in areas that looked like they contained suitable microhabitat for the species to try and increase capture probability, as well as some areas we simply couldn't tie any traps in. Um, but if I were to survey again in the future, and I had access to say four kilometers of stream, I might choose to just focus my efforts on one particular one kilometer or so stretch of that stream. I see, very good. Um, back to lunar phase again. How would you expect lunar phase to impact AST when they generally inhabit turbid slash murky waters where moonlight doesn't penetrate? That's that's the right question. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it is very puzzling, and it's as I said, there there's no mechanism I can think of to reliably explain that pattern. Um, well, one thing I will say about lunar phase and why I chose to examine this and incorporate it into my thesis is there have been so many similar studies to this one done. So. I would be interested to see um, other researchers look at their past survey data and see if they find a similar pattern or not, um, because it would be very easy to refute or confirm this pattern on a larger scale uh, with, with those data. Another question on the same topic. Um... Couldn't the effect lunar phase has on detectability correspond to tidal water levels? Uh, it could. I don't think it would have an impact given that most of our sites were pretty far inland. I'm not, uh, I'm not a hydrology expert, but I, I think the influence of the tide on, say, the Neches River 200, 200 miles inland would be negligible, but I, I'm not certain. Uh, what time of year did you conduct your trapping? So all our trapping occurred between April and October. And this, because we limited our trapping to these times, um, that's the reason I am inferring there was no strong relationship shown between water temperature or orbital date and detection probability. Um, if I had trapped throughout the year, I think a much stronger relationship would have popped out. Um, in one survey we conducted in April, we captured turtles when water temperatures were um, roughly 15 degrees Celsius. That was the coldest condition we trapped in. Um, and I, I actually wasn't expecting to catch any turtles during that time, but we captured five during those survey efforts. And, uh, oh, sorry, David. No, go ahead. I was going to say, we're running out of time here, but I don't think you mentioned in the talk the, um, the recapture of individuals from the previous study did you did i phase out for that part or did you did you talk about it no i i didn't talk about that um there was a question here about tracking and tracing devices placed on the captured turtles and that jogged my uh, memory about that maybe maybe we could wrap up with with um you you telling us about that so we recaptured three turtles um in 2000 in 2020 um, that were also captured in the previous survey two decades ago. And I think that's notable because those turtles were in virtually the exact same location. Um, and one of those individuals uh, had grown, uh, gained roughly 20 pounds, and the other one had grown almost none. Uh, so I think th those are interesting results. And as far as recapture is limited to my contemporary survey efforts, uh, we had roughly 10 recapture events. Uh, that information 
is in this manuscript we have in press right now, but uh, we had a pretty low recapture rate of individuals. 